Good day and welcome to A Place Called Through. My name is Patricia Goings and I am the host of A Place Called Through. We're broadcasting from WYTV7 Community Broadcasters Network. You know, this network along with A Place Called Through, we're all about a mission of hope. Our goal is to empower you and to encourage you. And you know, we hope that you are inspired with what we're doing here at A Place Called Through. You know, we have real people sharing those real life challenging stories. And they do that to help you as you're going through, you've been through, and maybe you're still trying to get through all together working for a place called through and that God is glorified in all that we're saying and all that we're doing. And so that's why we say a place called through inspirational moments. But you know, I want you to know that it's only done through your charitable donations. So I Thank you. I thank you for supporting this ministry so that we can continue to do what we do globally. And if you haven't sewn into the ministry, I ask you, please, $5, $10, $25, $500, whatever is on your heart, please sow that seed to help us continue on our mission of hope. Today, we are honored to have as our guest, Mr. Wayman Daniels, and he's going to share a life-challenging story that he has experienced. Hopefully, you know, you will be encouraged about this and you'll want to be our guest at a place called through. So, Mr. Daniels, we want to say welcome to this place called through. Well, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you for having me. It is my honor and my pleasure to have you as my guest. And we're going to go ahead and jump right on into it as we talked earlier about your life changing story, you know, because most people, you know, as children, you know, we share our lives of running around with our family, our friends, back and forth in school, and we all have those unique situations in our family. Some better, some worse, some unforgettable, and some more memorable. But we know that for you, growing up, you face many, many challenges. So we want to take this time out to start with that. The challenges of living at home with your parents. What was that like for you at a young age? Well. I wasn't home with my parents. I was home with a parent. And so growing up without a father was very difficult for me. When you have neighbors and friends who, whose father's there, you tend to say, well, where's my father? So it wasn't a great situation for me as a child because I had the missing factor in my life. And that played a part with a lot of decisions and choices that I made in my life. So, you know, because your dad was somewhat absent from your family, and like you said, that didn't make a difference. What was your relationship in your life with being, okay, home with your mom? And if you have any siblings, what was that like? Well, for me, as, as a male, I'm the only male. I have 10 sisters. And as a male, not having that male role model, it played a lot, of, it played a lot into who I, was, who I was and who I wanted to become. Um, again, when you don't see um, your father will have your father there to play football or give you some male dialogue like you see your other peers and friends having. It makes you just feel sad and abandoned, like no one, like he didn't love you or you wasn't worth a lot to him. And you notice I say a lot to him because I really wanted to know my father. I never heard his voice. I never saw him. I only saw pictures. So I was growing up with a big void in my life. And so because of the fact that was such a void, were there any other males in your family that possibly substituted that emotional side of not having your dad there or just being there, you know, male to male? Was there anybody else there that influenced you in terms of, you know, that relationship? Well, Patricia, believe it or not, I didn't have any positive role, role models in my life. Um, as we were talking um, previously, I stated that where I grew up in the inner city, which we call the hood, um, not block away was prostitution and pimping. And so the pimp became my role model because I didn't know what a male role model or figure looked like. So I looked externally for a role model and grafted to the streets as far as demeaning women, women had no value and et cetera, et cetera. And being a pimp was what um, everyone in the community was doing in that surrounding circumference of where I stayed. And so because this is, you know, the environment that you're in, you began to pick up some of those habits that you saw from the street versus having picked up the habits from, you know, your family life or, you know, the influences of your mom or your siblings. 
And like you said, you were the only male. So yes, you couldn't very well model a whole lot of what your sisters were doing, but you could have been impacted by some of the things that they were learning how to do. Um, but so let's go back. Your mom, what kind of influence did she have when you're growing up? Well, she could only go so far as from being a female. Um, when you're dealing with abandonment and you're looking for that male, male um, figure in your life, you tend to be rebellious. And I was very rebellious um, with my mom because I wanted my dad. I'm like, no, you, my mother, you can't teach me how to be a man. So I would only listen to it for, for so long and so far. And it didn't get me too far. I got a lot of spanking. <laughs> I got a lot of spankings because I was very hard-headed and rebellious. But I needed that role model. And it was a very dysfunctional relationship between my mother and myself. So because it was dysfunctional for you, and here you are now, you're longing for the love and, you know, the compassion and companionship of your dad. And no other male for you to, you know, to, to gravitate to. So going to school must have been really challenging for you as well, because, you know, as they celebrate Father and Son Day or your dad taking you to school and dropping you off and coming back to pick you up, that had to have been really challenging for you as well. So watching the other kids, you know, spending time with their dads, did that take you to a different place as well? It did because believe it or not, I believe I was maybe 11 or 12. My mother took me to see a psychologist because I was going to school, but I was looking out the window in La La Land. And when I was in La La Land, I was always thinking about my dad. What happened? Why isn't he here? Why doesn't he love me? Why did my mother leave my father? So when I went to the psychiatrist at the age of 11 or 12, they asked me what was wrong. And I, I stated to them, I want my dad. And so they told her what he's doing, he's acting out negatively because he wants his dad. And so I, I did that for, for about a year. And then we stopped doing that. And then we gravitated to something else. My mother and I, as far as getting me a job, being a renter kid, <laughs> she said, we got to keep you busy doing something. <laughs> so yeah, I ended up seeing a psychiatrist behind that. Wow, that's amazing. And so through your, you know, your, your time spending with the psychology, psychologist, you were able to release some of that anxiety now that you were feeling about not having a dad. But then something else began to develop and something else was happening because as you have stated, you know, you grew up, as you say, in the hood. Um, and now you're seeing the life of, you know, prostitution and pimps. So you're thinking that the pimp is this role model uh, correct me if I'm wrong, because he's the man and he's the one that seems to be dominating everything. Is this what you're imagining at that point? That, that's, that's correct, because that was, that, that was the negative role model. But they gave me the male attention that I was, that I was craving. And so now what's, what's happening now, Patricia, is I crave this attention negatively or um, positively. I wanted that attention, so I just I just strove for that negative attention, which I thought was positive attention at that particular moment. And so, um, following the pimps and the behavior of the mills in my community, it, it grafted me, or gra I gravitated to drugs and alcohol, and started doing very antisocial behaviors at the age of 13 and 14 years old. Uh -huh. And so, at that point of your life, okay, because you began to do these. The, the 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 worldly things the things that the street does what how did your mom react to you you know with this because this is a new thing for you now so what was your mom and your siblings reaction to this new now behavior that you've adopted well with my mom my mom used to work for the state the state of new york and she worked with at-risk youth and her favorite thing was you keep acting up we're gonna put you in the boys home <laughs> And I would, I, at that particular moment, I was fearful of it, but it never happened. So as she kept on threatening and kept on threatening, I said, oh, she's just talking. She ain't gonna never put me in a boy's home. So I became callous to the threats. And um, so as time progressed, she didn't really know as far as the streets, how much the streets had a hold on me because I was not yet at that real, real, real super rebellious point where it got me into super trouble until later on in my life. So I kept that to what, what I thought undercover, but my grades were a reflection of that. And so, you know, okay, you mentioned that you, you were the only boy and with your other sibling. 
So the relationships that you saw them having with, you know, guys, how did you feel about that? Well, I was so callous about relationships because I became numb to them. Um, and what I mean by that, by me feeling like I was abandoned and not loved, um, Patricia, I didn't allow any emotion to come into my life. I became so callous to everything. They would have a boyfriend, like, okay, that's you. It didn't bother me. I didn't care. Um, anything my mother would say didn't bother me. I, I didn't care because I didn't want to be hurt again. So at the very early age, I became what you call hard, meaning emotionally dead. And I, I lived my life like that for a long period of time. But later on, we'll discuss what happened, why the change came about. I don't want to go ahead of you. Absolutely. And that's what I'm trying to establish here with our listeners and our viewers. You know, we want to get that background out because when we come back out for the commercial break, then we're going to go ahead on into, you know, that part of it. So I'm just really wanting to share with them, you know, so that they'll know who you are and where you've been and where you are now. Um, the fact is that you did not want to really establish any outside relationships with anyone because of the hurt that you were still living with of not having your father there and no one else, I guess, any male figure to turn to in your moments of anxiety. So you therefore shut down on any interest of having any relationship. Am I correct there? No, you're, you're correct in saying that. Yes, I did. I shut down all relationships and feelings. And so you previously stated about, you, you know, you're going now to counseling, see a psychologist. So how did they encourage you to develop relationships now? Because as a well, therapist, I mean, I'm a life coach. I'm a health and wellness coach. I'm an evangelist. I'm an author. I'm a playwright. And one of the things, as you we stated here, is our jobs are to empower you and encourage you. And so from the perspective of a psychologist, and I studied Christian counseling and psychology, and one of the things would be is to give you that reality check to help you to look for the interrelationships. So how did that happen for you there? Well, I got flustered with that because at <laughs> 11, 10, 11, 11, 11 to 12 years old, I don't know what they were doing. They would take me outside to play football and play catch. <laughs> so I told my mother, I said, listen, I can play football on the streets. I don't need to be here. Um, but they just tried to help me to understand that your mother's doing the best she can. And that you, at this particular moment, I forgot to mention that I, at this moment, I had a, my stepfather has always been in my life from the age of, I think I was a year old up until present, but I never acknowledged or accepted him as my father. And so the psychologist would try to tell me, you need to accept him because he's playing the role of your father. But Patricia, I didn't want to hear that. I wanted, you know, I wanted what I wanted. I you wanted want dad. dad. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's understandable. And while they were taking you outside, you know, trying to get you to this place to call through was to get you to release. And in order to release it, they had to get you into a comfortable situation in hopes that you would say something, you know, about your dad and you would open up into a conversation because cognitively that's what the, you know, I believe is what they were looking for. But you were st still in this rebellious state because all you could see was this painted picture was that your dad was not there. You really didn't care about anything or anybody else. Um, but one question before we go to commercial break, did your relationship with your mom, did it, um, did it develop any changes towards her, even though you knew that she was doing the best she could? Did it develop into a more, you know, closer relationship or did you separate from her? Well, me and my mom's relationship was really bad. Um, the reason I say that because um, it's a lot to the story of a misdiagnosis. And the misdiagnosis came from her, my aunties and my uncles stating that I was going to be dumb, that I would never amount to anything. And so, Patricia, I became exactly what they said. And so it became very strange because, again, abandonment hurt from people that you love. First my dad, now my mom. And so that was very difficult for me. So I became very rebellious and very anti-social. And I became very hard pertaining to a lot of things because of these things. Because of that. Okay, well, we want to take time out for our commercial break. And after that, we'll come back and we're going to wrap it up with you. And we'll talk a little bit further about your story of making the changes in your life. Stay tuned. We'll be right back at a place called through. I'm Dr. Raquel Tolson, host of Blessed. 
mindset matters. Is your mind on your money? Are you ready to be more intentional with your money? Then get my free booklet, Mind on My Money, Plan, Pocket, Protect. In this booklet, I offer you practical suggestions on planning intentionally, pocketing wisely, and protecting your money. Get the booklet at www.raykeltolson.com. That's R-A-Y-K-E-L-T-O-L-S-O-N. Get your free copy today. Welcome back to A Place Called Through. I am your host, Patricia Wade Goings, and we're broadcasting from WYTV7 Community Broadcasters Network. And we've been talking with our guest today, Mr. Wayman Daniels, and he's been sharing his life challenging story. You know, as we always stay at a place called through, everybody has their own place called through, be it going through, getting through, and still trying to go through. And so he's, he's written a book on all of those things because he certainly has been through those hard times of having his dad not in his life, living with, you know, other siblings, which were all females and being the only male no one else to turn to. His mom was doing the very best she could working every day trying to provide for the family. And so he decided because of the, the area, as he quoted earlier, the hood, the only thing that he could see was the streetly you know, lifestyle, the, the pimps and the prostitution and the drugs. And so we want to pick back up with Mr. Daniels as we continue on to this story about how the street influenced his life at a very early age and the things that happen now because of this, even though he's been in counseling, the counseling just kind of played basketball with him outside, but that wasn't what he wanted. He wanted his dad. So talk to us, Mr. Daniels. Now we've gotten you past the counseling. We've gotten past, you know, your relationship with your mom and your siblings, but you had such a desire to have your dad that you now turn to the streets. So take us to what the streets has brought you up to. Oh man, those streets have caused me a lot of pain. But at that particular moment, my thinking was very convoluted that the streets was everything. Had fun, um, you can drink, you can smoke weed. That was the starting point. You can have these little girlfriends and all this other stuff and nothing else mattered, you know, because I was finally accepted amongst a group called peers or men. But this group was a gang. I got involved in a gang. And with that gang became very negative activities, which progress that led me to actually um, going to uh, the state penitentiary for seven years. But before I even got um, to prison, I failed to mention that I became strung out on drugs, heroin and crack cocaine. And in the process of doing that, I started doing crime. And with the crime I ended up doing, I was sentenced to 20 years, Patricia, but they gave me seven. And, I, and I'm, I'm so happy that they, I got seven instead of the 20 because I almost passed out. And I told the judge when he sentenced me, I said, hey, man, I ain't killed nobody. But my lawyer told me to be quiet. <laughs> but, you know, and, and then, you know, and that was a blessing in disguise, too. Um, in fact, that one of the things that you mentioned while you were incarcerated, you had visitations from your daughter. And two of the things that your daughter said to you, each one said something separately made you sit back and really think. So share with our listeners and our viewers, you mentioned to me earlier um, that you had a daughter at that time, she was 12 years old, and she stated to you that she wanted a man in her life like you. How did that make you feel? Well, even thinking about it now, it, I'm very emotional because I feel like crying because those words resonate with me every day. And I sat there and I looked at my daughter and said to myself, you want a man like me? All I've been doing is doing drugs and being a womanizer and never was faithful to your mother. And I cut the visit short and I went to my cell and I cried like I feel like doing now. And I had to think about changing my life, but that wasn't the only thing, but I'll let you go to your next question. And we're- And well, that would be my next point is that you know, and it's okay if you if you want to get emotional, a place called through. That's what happens here with us. It's not, you know, to embarrass you or to make you feel uncomfortable. It's here to help you and our listeners and our viewers. Um, but your seven-year-old also came to visit you, and she had a different perspective on her visitation 
if you would, and if you wouldn't mind, share that thought with us about how she made you feel. Well, my seven-year-old came two weeks later, and she says, Dad, um, you don't love me anymore. And I said, why did you say that? And um, my baby said to me, because you left home to come here. And again, I cut the visit short. And he went back to my cell and cried and, and, and just said, I need to change my life. Because when your children tell you something like that, if it doesn't hurt you or make you think, then something's wrong with you. And I would so, agree with you. Yeah, yeah. So while you were incarcerated, did your your um, your mom come to visit you? Did you what kind of conversations did you have with her? Well, my mom would come once a month, and when she would come and drop off thirty five pounds and put money into my commissary, I often I told her one time I said, "Mom, I said thank you for coming to my gravesite." And she said, "What do you mean?" I said, "Because I'm in a cell that looks like a grave." And I said, every now and then you'll come put flowers on my grave and remember me. I said, I really appreciate you doing that. I said, um, it's a, this is a bad place to be, but I'm going to come out of that because I looked at her and I looked what I put her through, Patricia, the things that she had to go through just to come on the visiting floor to see me. They would pat her down, make her take off certain items of her clothing and degrade her just to come see me for something that I'd done. So I did see the love in her, but I also saw the hurt and pain in her that I caused her. And no son wants to see his mother deal with that. So there was a lot of things going on while I was in prison. And so I just made up my mind that I had to change. But then also in a previous conversation, two things that we, you and I have talked about was that you at one point began to blame God. And it was like, okay, you, you no longer believed in God because of all the things that you had gone through, even though the crimes that you committed, you knew that they were wrong in the sight of God, but now you're at a place where, okay, I, I, I don't believe, I don't trust God. And one thing that you did state to me was that you told God that you'd punch him in his face. And I told him that because I was taught that God is all powerful. And it's been many days and many nights that I sit in the drug house and ask God to deliver me if you can part the Red Sea, if you can do all these things that I heard about, stop me from using drugs. Stop me from doing the things that I'm doing. You allowed me to go to prison. You did this, you allowed my father to leave. And I told him literally, if you were a tangible being, I would punch you in your face. And that's how sick I was. And that was because of the drugs and the alcohol and, and the things that were speaking with you. Um, but we also noted too that at one point you noted that six months at six months old your dad pulled the gun on your mom. He did, he did, and that's why she left. Me and her never had the conversation to, in detail what was the real reason behind it, but it helped me to understand just a little bit more why she done what she done because she had not only to save her life, she had to save my life. But at at that particular moment when she told me this, I was still like maybe fourteen or fifteen but I was still looking for my dad to come home. And Patricia, the sad thing about, well, the beautiful thing about it or the sad thing about it, I didn't start accepting my real dad or my stepfather until I went to prison. And I went to prison probably at, I believe I was like 37. I was still looking for my real dad to come home and he had got shot when I was 13 and killed. That's how sick I was. Amazing. But, you know, because of your, your, your time in prison, you're, you know, pretty much, letting the streets teach you one of the things like you were saying that you know it became a habit you were it became such a habit so you were a hustler but you were blindsided in the hustle because several things and I'm kind of pushing so we can go ahead and get you to the end um was that even though you were married you know you actually began this habit still just had not left you because you actually were stealing from your own family you were stealing, sold, sold the things that belonged to your children, their Christmas toys. I mean, you just sold pretty much whatever you could to support this now what became your habit that you weren't able to break. But one thing, even though you're saying, okay, you know, God, if, if you're real, I, I want to punch you in your face. 
So did that lead you to the robbery of the church? Well, I'll tell you one thing. Remember, uh, Satan was walking to and fro seeking whom he made the vow, right? <laughs> and Absolutely. Laughed, and then, I was just looking for an opportunity to support my drug habit. And the church at that particular moment was an opportunity. And the thing about that is, in which it's, it's crazy now, the same church that I robbed, God says, I want you to go back and be a member of that church. And I'm a member of that church right now. So I did it because I saw the opportunity. But that goes to show you the power of being influenced by the devil and up under his control, just like the demoniac. Absolutely. And, and the thing was that during this time that, you know, you were so the world had your mind, you know, the evil forces was controlling what you were doing and how you were living. But then you've gotten to this point now where you're now redeemed and you're actually helping put people through your very own ministry. Um, you've been clean, you noted, and since 2008. Thank God for that. You're an addiction counselor and you also have now a business open my communication. So talk to us a little bit because the clock is winding down on the open my communication. What is that about? Open my communication is a professional leadership um, course that I teach facilitating character and integrity. Um, teaching people that you can be in leadership position and still not be a great leader. In order to be a great leader, you have to understand what character and integrity is. And so we talk about strategies and talk about barriers. We talk about behaviors, everything that I went through to a degree and apply it to the business world, the um, normal community and normal people. And we just try to break this thing down so we can be the best that we can be and be kingdom citizens. It's, it's, a, it's a great organization and business that I have. But Patricia, one more other thing that I do. I'm also a host, again, of Level Up Podcast and an activist in my community, which stopped the violence. And that's awesome that you were able to turn your life around in such that you're now influencing, you know, other youth, other males, you know, um, other people who may be going down that same path that you've been there and done that with. And such an amazing thing to know that you are involved wholeheartedly into the church, into ministry, uh, because you were the one that turned on God. He didn't turn on you. You wanted to go into battle with him. And unbeknownst to you, he was already fighting with you because he had a purpose for you. And he wanted you just to see that, yes, I am God. I am God alone. And so he brought you through this place so that he could get what? Your attention. And now you're sharing it with Level Up and also Open My Communication. So now that we've, you know, you've gone through all of that, what is your family life like now? Because you're married with your own family. What, is, what kind of relationship do you have with your, you know, your siblings, your mom, and with your, you know, your family? What is life like now? Well, my family is great, man. My, my, I tell you what, years ago, be, when I, before all this happened, before I went to prison, I could never get my mother bank card. Now she say, go to the bank, get some money for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, wow, um, wow, well, amazing. See that trust, that 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 son and mom <laughs> trust factor had to come back in. Because you were you were out there, you were like a loose cannon. You were doing some of everything and anything that the world told you about. But share with our listeners and our viewers real quickly, if you will, Mr. Daniels. And I want to personally just thank you for being my guest today on a place called Food and sharing your story. You know, of letting go. Um, you know, letting go of your past, getting through it all because you had to be redeemed and you did let go of your past. And we thank you for sharing that. But because the clock is running out of time and very quickly, I want you to share with our listeners and our viewers how they can find your blog, you know, information on Level Up and whatever you're working on. And if they want to reach out to you, give us a phone number and email and you've got about half a second to do so. Okay, you can reach me at Facebook, Wayman Daniels, um, Instagram, Wayman Daniels, YouTube, Wayman Daniels Level Up. And um, you can just reach me, Daniels Wayman 248 at yahoo.com, 585-524-9997. Look forward to hearing from you guys. Thank you. And again, I do thank you for being my guest and sharing your story today on A Place Called Through. I've been your host, Patricia Wade Goings, and I am evangelist. I am your health and wellness and your life coach. I am the author of a book, Willpower, The Call to Rise Above. Find me on Facebook at A Place Called Through at Willpower, The Call to Rise Above. My website is live for upcoming events and also broadcasts that I will share there with you. 
at www.willpowerthecall to rise above. And you know, if you want to share your story, please reach out to me in area code of 843-608-9744 or just send me an email at pgoingswp at gmail.com. I'm here for you. So if you want me, just give me a call. Looking forward to hearing from you and seeing you soon. And once again, send those donations into this ministry to help us continue globally as we do so here at a place called through. Blessings and love.